Joint Committee in relation to the detailed scrutiny of the Private Members' Bill. Uh, Deputy Breed Smith, a sponsor of the Bill, is joined by her advisor, Mr Owen McCormick. Uh, you're very welcome, Mr McCormick, to the Committee. Uh, Deputy Smith and the main witnesses shall speak for approximately seven to ten minutes each, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Each member can ask a question, not more than three minutes uh, for, per question. Uh, we're going to open Deputy Smith, a sponsor of the Bill. Uh, I'm going to invite Deputy Smith to give uh, an overview, maybe seven to ten minute overview of the Bill, um, and Deputy Smith, you have the floor. Um, and I want to say to yourself and the members that I'm going to do my best to be brief and deal with the main issues as I see them in relation to passing this bill and instituting a ban on fossil fuel exploration in Ireland. Uh, first, let me say a few words on why I believe the bill is needed. We have witnessed here in Ireland and globally the effects of rising CO2 levels on our climate. The rise in the number of extreme weather events, deadly heat waves, prolonged droughts, record-breaking rain events heat waves and uh, break and rain events are all well documented. Records are broken routinely and the five warmest years in global record have all come in the 2010s. Globally we are now one degree above the pre-industrial average temperature and heading fast for 1.5 degree. Uh, climate change is creating millions of climate refugees globally and impacting with devastating consequences on the lives of millions more. And it's also threatening our Earth's biodiversity and accelerating the sixth great extinction event in the history of our planet. I've been struck that in this debate, the opponents of this measure have not sought to cast any doubt on the issue of climate change. On one level, this is welcome. There are few climate change deniers who would publicly challenge the scientific consequences on the cause and effects of climate change. So I note that the submissions from IBEC and the IOOA and others all talk of the need to take action. They all accept the fact that our climate is changing and the future of energy production must be renewable and that we must reduce our emissions. But I can take little comfort from the widespread acceptance there is that because there is a disconnect between accepting the science and the facts and the unwillingness to take the steps that are needed. You'll hear today from Professor John Sweeney and Dr. Amanda Slevin, who will put the climate emergency into some context and who will look at our licensing regime. And next week, our witnesses will look at the feasibility of renewable energy replacing fossil fuels on the scale needed and in the time necessary. The message from these witnesses will all be that radical action is possible and radical action and policies are necessary. The numbers don't add up for those advocates of continuing fossil fuel exploration. We cannot globally burn the proved reserves of oil, gas or coal and hope to reach the Paris targets of under 2 degrees temperature rises. This bill is a first step, but only a first. It doesn't pretend to solve the crisis or reduce emissions by itself, but it will send a clear signal that Ireland is part of a global movement that is prepared to take action and deal with the use of fossil fuels. So I want to look at the provisions of the bill and what it seeks to do. Once CO2 emissions globally are above 350 parts per million, this bill will ensure that the Minister does not issue any licences, undertakings or leases for the exploration or extraction of fossil fuels in Ireland. This bill would place Ireland at the front of a global movement to tackle climate change. The continued use of fossil fuels at the levels currently being used globally will mean that we would use up the global carbon budget within decades and fail to limit temperature increases to under 2 degrees Celsius. This is a death sentence for large parts of humanity and large sections of the Earth's biodiversity. If this doesn't constitute an emergency, then, Chairman, I don't know what the definition of an emergency should be. In acknowledging this, the Bill puts down a clear marker that the future cannot be based on fossil fuels if we wish to make the planet a habitable site for humanity and other species. Let me deal briefly with some of the criticisms and arguments against this measure. The first one is that it will harm energy security, undermine jobs in the industry and make us reliant on Russian gas in a volatile political climate. I don't accept that there is any security, energy-wise or otherwise, in a planet that will be two degrees warmer than the pre-industrial level and which is heading on current trajectories to two, three and four degrees within the next generation or two. However, let us be honest about our own licensing regime as it stands and our current and predicted use of gas and other fuels. 
If there is significant fines in Irish waters, something I think is unlikely, but pretend there was, it will be under existing licences issued under the 1992, 2007 or 2014 licensing terms. And under those terms, companies are not required to sell resources back to the state or to use Ireland as a base for servicing. The state will receive no royalties on any such find and our tax regime is acknowledged by all, including the department itself, as among the most generous for companies anywhere in the world. In relation to gas and our use of it, we do not currently use Russian gas, nor will we in the future, even under the, the current uh, market demands. We meet over 50% of our own gas needs from indigenous sources at Corrib and Kinsale. The balance of the natural gas requirement is imported from Britain, and our gas from Britain could be a, a system of subsea pipelines from Scotland. Britain has four main sources, its own offshore UK North Sea natural gas at 35% of its source, Norwegian North Sea natural gas at 38%, continental natural gas at 15% and imported liquefied natural gas or LNG at 12%. The sources of our gas are therefore safe and secure. This bill will do nothing to change that. Energy security, I believe, is a red herring to try to justify the continued exploration and use of fossil fuels. If a large find of oil or gas were discovered, we're looking at a minimum of 15 to 20 years for that to be used. That source itself would last another 20 years plus. Effectively, by continuing to explore for gas and oil, we are saying that we will lock our energy systems and our electricity systems into continued domination by fossil fuels, continuing high levels of emissions. Last year, Providence Resources suggested they might find some 5 billion barrels of oil. They didn't, but supposing they had, those 5 billion barrels, when burned, would have resulted in 1.5 billion tonnes of CO2. The Drew Drumbeg field alone could therefore potentially have produced the equivalent of all Ireland's greenhouse gas, green, greenhouse gas emissions at 2016 levels for the next quarter of a century. That would have been a boom to the shareholders and the stockholders of a few companies, but it would have simply added to the total levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. It would have undermined the switch to renewables and the needed investment in alternative policies to achieve that. It would not replace Russian gas or Norwegian or North American gas. It would simply be added to them. Is anyone seriously suggesting that we should keep looking for new resources of carbon while expecting or hoping that the areas that already have those proven reserves will leave them in the ground? This is not a serious proposition. We need to leave 80% of known reserves of fossil fuels in the ground. Searching for more will not aid our energy security. Secondly, we need and will want more gas. It is a transitional fuel, low in carbon emission, and can help us move to a carbon neutral energy policy, so the opponents of this bill say. It is true that gas may emit less CO2 than coal, however gas is not an environmentally climate uh, friendly fuel. It is a high emitting CO2 fuel. A large scale switch to gas is not a solution to climate change. It is simply a way of postponing the kind of radical action we need and continuing the fossil fuel infrastructure that is propelling us to catastrophic climate change. I urge the committee members here to give serious consideration to the submission from Dr John Broderick of Manchester University. He and his colleague Kevin Anderson, who is one of the leading climate scientists in the world, are quoted here. One, current levels of emissions will use up the EU's two degree carbon budget in under nine years. Two, fossil fuels, including natural gas, have no substantial role in an EU two degree energy system beyond 2035. Within two decades, fossil fuel use, including gas, must have all but ceased, with complete decarbonisation following soon after. There is no room here for substantial gas sector post-2035. Yet some submissions to this committee pretend otherwise. If we are still extracting gas post-2035, still exploring for it in the next day, decade and planning it post-2050, we're saying goodbye to Paris, goodbye to any hopes of under two degrees temperature rises and admitting that we cannot stop cat catastrophic climate change. Let's not pretend that gas is a solution to climate change when we know it is part of the problem. Global trickery and pretense have largely been the hallmark of the response to climate change. Carbon credits, offsets and capture and storage have all been used to avoid actually reducing fossil fuel use. In the words of Bob Dylan, let us not talk falsely now for the hour is getting late. We can falsify accounts for CO2 emissions all we like. The ultimate and accurate measure is the global levels in the atmosphere and we cannot fool nature. 
Last year, the levels of CO2 reached 411 parts per million, the highest in the history of the planet and the highest in perhaps over 2 million years. Last year, we emitted the largest amounts of CO2 from human sources in history, and that is after knowing for 30 years the science and the facts on climate and carbon. It's time to stop the pretense and the falsehoods. I want to put it to this committee that all these arguments on energy security, gas as a bridging fuel, the possibility of new technology of capturing and storing, all of these and their proponents are simply attempts to put off the necessary action to tackle climate change. I will finish by saying that we in People Before Profit are open and welcoming to work with all deputies and senators. We're open to amendments that will strengthen the provisions and will ensure that the bill does what it seeks to do to ban the exploration of fossil fuels in Ireland. And finally, uh, a bit of housework. There's a small drafting error here that will need to be addressed. The bill talks of Part 3 of the Principal Act and it should read Part 2. But we are open to and welcome discussion that will see Ireland move from being a laggard, as described by the Taoiseach, in the fight against climate change to being a leader in the fight against climate change. Very good. Thank you, Debbie Smith, for that. Uh some questions, Mr Shannon, because what you've just said negates the whole attempt that's going on here, that this bill has a consequence of increasing emissions rather than reducing them. Now, I take that extraordinarily seriously, and I assume you've evidence for that, and I'm going to ask you, please, to provide that evidence and to show us exactly by how much will it increase emissions, exactly how much more CO2 will be uh, forced into the atmosphere by this bill, and exactly how much will the temperature of the earth increase as a result? You know, will it be 0.5 of a degree or will it be... I think you need to come up with the science that says that rather than having a sweeping uh, declaration that this is what, what may happen. And if I may, Chair, I'd like to ask the Department a few questions Absolutely. after I get the answer, if okay. that's all right. I'll, I'll bring it um, I come back to, to the figures that uh, Indigenous and European oil and gas uh, emit 30 per cent uh, less CO2 than gas which is produced and oil which is produced from outside uh, the EU. Um, and uh, these, these are facts uh, that come from IOGP, the International Association of uh, Oil and Gas Producers, uh, who are effectively worldwide. Mr Shannon, that's very disingenuous. We don't bring energy from Siberia to Ireland. That just doesn't happen. Most of our energy comes from connectors with Britain, which come mostly from Norway um, and the North Sea. And, but parking that to one side, the, the, the premise this bill is trying to get across is that this just isn't just the responsibility of a little island on the edge of the Atlantic. This is a global responsibility. And as has been mentioned by uh, two of the scientists that have contributed here today, both of them mentioned the five countries who have already created uh, a ban on the uh, exploration of fossil fuel. And I try to emphasise that partially what we're doing here, or a big part of what we're doing here, is to be a contributor to that global movement that says, wake up, smell the coffee, leave it in the ground. Now, the, 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 the opponents of this bill are saying, no, you must keep drilling it, you must keep producing more, because uh, despite the fact that 80% of no fossil fuels have to remain in the ground, and they haven't disputed that science, uh, you are saying let's get more out of the ground and have this kind of suite of measures or complement it with, um, or complement it with renewables. And yet, we have tried to show you here today that even if you found the five billion barrels or whatever Providence boasted that they might get last year, it would take another between 25 to 40 years to be able to use that, which brings you right up to the, practically the middle of the century, at which point we're supposed to be bringing our carbon emissions right down. So, the, you know, I think when you address one aspect of it, I'd like you to attempt to address the holistic aspect of it, rather than seeing this emissions above Ireland are like this, above Norway they're like that, above Siberia they're like that. This is a planet. Uh, professor us to satisfy ourselves that any impacts uh, on habitats and birds and dolphins in particular um, are, are mitigated and that we can control it. Um, this study, the, the OBSERVE study, is one of the largest programs of its kind undertaken in the world. It is a world class, and I think the 
uh, the other departments that involve the, uh, uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, it will provide a base for ecological data for many years to come for researchers. So I think it's an important piece of work to provide baseline uh, ecological habitats data, which provides a robust, a robust baseline for environmental assessments. Okay, well, will you answer the other question I asked you, please? I'm not trying to be um, provocative here, but oh, yeah. really I would like an answer to why, for example, uh, Island Expo and Partners discovered gas in 2007 on the Skull Discovery, and their lease undertaking application has been under consideration since 2011. That's seven years. Why is it taking so long? And would you tell us that in the course of that seven years, does that company then have... Uh, like a tenancy or ownership of that section offshore. Nobody else can go in there, touch it, uh, explore it, ask any questions about it, because over that seven year period, and in, ca in other cases, sometimes almost longer, that uh, it, decisions on uh, granting of undertakings or lease applications have taken so long. Is there uh, some way, is it some way convenient between the companies and the department that they take this long period of time? Well, the, the length of time that a, le a lease may exist is going to be largely dependent on the circumstance of that particular lease. But all leases, as, as I said, are subject to uh, contain a, a work program. And that work program are the conditions. Well, yeah, but I think I've learned a lot from here today because it's quite clear to me, although I, you know, from a lot of reading and uh, from reading the various submissions, I suspected that uh, the industry and the representatives and the captains of the oil and gas industry have their head in the sands and don't really get it that the environment and the planet is in serious trouble and therefore we have to move rapidly and decisively to change in the way we do business. It's been really proven here to me this evening with the question and back and forth that that is actually the case. They don't get it, they want to continue with business as usual and they're prepared to put the profits that their companies make before the interests of the planet and its people. Okay, thank you. I'm going to leave it there. I want to thank all our witnesses for coming.